record button. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Excited to be here and <clears throat> teach on the Gospel of John. <clears throat> a lot of complicated things. So I'm going to do the best I can to uh, to make them. Uh, as understandable as possible. So change this display. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to briefly go over the stuff that we did last Sunday, just kind of quickly go through that. I'm not going to read everything that we did, but just in a way to kind of catch up from where we were. Some people weren't here uh, this last Sunday. Um, <clears throat> so as we did when we looked at Mark and Matthew and Luke, we talked about the authorship of the fourth gospel. And uh, we talked about how um, it was attributed as the gospel according to John uh, from a very early, very early stage in its transmission. Um, there are really only three John figures that could have written it. Um, we also noticed that uh, the end of the book in chapter 21, there seems to be an appendix on this gospel um, written by uh, someone else actually uses a plural pronoun. It says, we, uh, we know that his testimony is true. And it refers to the author of the first part of the gospel, the uh, chapters one through 20, I should say, as this guy named the beloved disciple or the disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, and then John 19 has that beloved disciple there as an eyewitness and an ear witness of the cross. So we can see there that the first 20 chapters were written by an eyewitness and ear witness. Um, he was a close disciple of Jesus. And um, the implication of one of the passages in chapter 21 is that by the time chapter 21 was written, that this beloved disciple had died and was rounded off by this other group of people. <clears throat> so um, out of the three possible Johns who could have written this, John Mark, doesn't make sense because he wrote the gospel of Mark and this is clearly a different gospel. Um, the John who wrote the book of revelation is uh, clearly writing something different when you look at his argument, uh, the Greek text and uh, his circumstances. He's not writing from Ephesus. He's writing from Patmos. So really only leaves uh, John, the son of Zebedee, who's the apostle as the candidate for authorship, which is what most people believed anyway. So <clears throat> we have an eyewitness testimony of an apostle, writing this and you can't say that about mark and you can't say that about luke you can say it about matthew though um where is this gospel written from and to whom is it written uh we got a lot of evidence that that this was written from ephesus ephesus is on the west coast of asia minor it's got a quarter of a million people living in it <clears throat> um we got all these different uh uh church fathers patristic fathers that uh, give their testimony that John wrote his gospel while living in Ephesus. We don't have any reason to doubt anything that they're saying there. Um, and we also have this episode in Acts 19, and I do need to, to uh, clarify something. I, I think I misspoke uh, last Sunday here. Because um, in Acts 19, we actually have Paul come across some believers. And uh, when I went back and looked at this passage, they were actually Christians. They were believers in Jesus. But prior to becoming believers in Jesus, they were disciples of John the Baptist, and they had actually submitted to John the Baptist's baptism. But they had not received the Holy Spirit, so Paul rebaptized them in water, and they received the Holy Spirit. But the point is, we have people that, um, in Ephesus, according to Acts 19, who were former disciples of John the Baptist. They had become Christians, uh, but they were still there. <clears throat> and so the point is that, We've got external evidence, which are the uh, basically point number one, and it's four subpoints that point to Ephesus. And we have some internal evidence within the Bible that suggests <clears throat> that, uh, that, that John the Baptist was a figure of interest, even decades after his death, in Ephesus. And this helps us to explain a variety of passages <clears throat> in the Gospel of John that uh, – seem to indicate that uh, John the Baptist needed to um, needed to have his prominence respectfully decreased while Jesus needed to have his importance increased. And of course that doesn't need to be said 
by most people unless John the Baptist is still highly favored where you're at. So the point is, Ephesus seems to be really the only option we have on the table in regard to uh, where John the Apostle was when he wrote this and where his community was as well. And again, Ephesus was a major um, uh, center of early Christianity. Uh, we know that uh, in the first century, it had a quarter of a million people living in it. And that's from the first century standpoint, that is very large. <clears throat> um, we also noticed that there are a lot of differences between John and the synoptics. Remember, the synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, we have Matthew and Luke starting with these birth narratives. John starts with the incarnation of God's word. Uh, the synoptics have Jesus going to Jerusalem only once in the last week of his mission, but in John's gospel, Jesus is active in Judea. That's the region um, where Jerusalem is the capital for most of his mission. So uh, Jesus in Judea quite frequently in John's gospel. Uh, the synoptics only mention one Passover to where John mentions uh, three different times, which is a notice, notice emphasis. <clears throat> I want us to kind of keep in mind here that John's gospel is pressing the fact <coughs> of the Passover and is actually um, uh, the only gospel to make the argument that Jesus is the new Passover lamb. Um, the synoptics rarely have Jesus speaking about himself, but John has these lengthy statements where he says, I am, you know, followed by a predicate. Um, I am the door. I am the true bread. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, synoptics have lots of aphorisms and parables. Well, John chooses to give his arguments with these lengthy dialogues, uh, some very long, 40, 50 verses. <clears throat> uh, the synoptics have lots of exorcisms, um, and uh, the casting out of demons, while John doesn't have any of these. Um, the synoptics will talk about eternal life. Um, all three of them together, Matthew, Mark, and Luke combined, will use this phrase eternal 14 times. Well, John by himself is going to use it 17 times. Uh, that doesn't mean that the synoptics don't believe in eternal life. Certainly they do. Uh, you'll note kind of the other uh, shift in emphasis is that the synoptics will talk about the kingdom of God far more frequently. Uh, something like a hundred times total between the three of those or something around there uh, to where John will use it uh, in only three verses, five times in three verses. So obviously uh, the future kingdom of God and eternal life are synonymous themes, but it just, the point is John is doing something different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are related to each other from a literary standpoint that Matthew and Luke used Mark as a source. John did not use Matthew, Mark, or Luke as its source. John is doing his own thing. That's the point of that passage. Okay. Um, we want to know why John was written and uh, what is his point, but it's pretty clear that there are opponents in John's gospel. And it's very easy to see the identity of these opponents. Um, I wrote that it's abundantly clear that the opponents of Jesus in John are the Jews. And you'll see this phrase called the Jews 71 times in John's gospel, but only three times combined in Matthew, Mark, and Luke if you discount the references to Jesus being the king of the Jews. So again, that jumps off the chart to me, 71 times compared to three combined in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So very clear there that the Jews are there. I'm also, I'm hearing someone's mic. Um, so um, please, if you could mute that, that'd be really helpful. Well, thank you. Um, we also saw that there was an emphasis in John's gospel that's not anywhere else in the New Testament of people being kicked out of the synagogue we, uh, there are three passages there where there's this phrase, uh, expulsion from the synagogue or uh, being kicked out of the synagogue, using a word that does not appear anywhere else. I'm still hearing someone's mic. Please, can you mute that? I'd appreciate that. Um, number three, uh, we see that uh, John, the Gospel of John, is framing his gospel in order to portray Jesus as the climax of Judaism. We also saw this in Matthew's gospel, but the reason that Matthew had to highlight that Jesus was the climax of Judaism was because the opponents in Matthew's gospel were Jews claiming to be the true interpreters and the true authority of Judaism after the destruction of the temple. So it's not going to be surprising to us if John, also written after the destruction of the temple, is dealing with the same thing, especially when the opponents are the Jews. Okay. Um, and so John has all these different arguments about Jesus being the climax of Judaism. Um, in particular, uh, we got these two references in the very first chapter, Jesus being the Passover that doesn't just deal with Israel's sins. It deals with the world's sin. 
Um, and I gave all these different references there. I don't have time to go through and look at them. One in particular, the one in 219 through 21, Jesus is the new temple. Okay. The place where you go and visit God is not a building with four walls and a roof. It is now Jesus who is the true embodiment of the presence of God. That's actually a very uh, powerful and high thing to say of Jesus. Um, lots of different things that could be said there. Uh, Jesus greater uh, than Moses. Jesus is greater than uh, Jacob. Jesus is greater than Abraham. Um, and then lastly, in chapter 15, Jesus is the true vine to where Israel as a nation was actually called the vine throughout the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. So three major things there um, that I think we should pull out is that uh, John has an emphasis on Jesus being the Passover lamb. Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't make that emphasis. Uh, Jesus is the new temple. Uh, that could subtly be seen um, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but it's very clearly stated as a controversial point in John's gospel. And Jesus is the true vine. And we need to align ourselves to that true vine so that we can bear more fruit. Okay. Um, the Jews and John's response. So here we're actually coming to new content for this week. Okay. So we know who the opponents are. The opponents are the Jews. Okay. And if the Jews are the opponents, what are they saying about Jesus? And why did John have to write his gospel in response to their criticisms? That's a pretty good question that we could look at the evidence for and try to find an answer. Okay, I'm going to force myself to slow down here. Okay, so number one, having noted the emphasis on the opponents, the Jews, and John's arrangement of his gospel to demonstrate Jesus as the climax of Judaism, that's what I did in the last two slides, we can now note other Christological emphases used to answer the polemical attacks of the Johannine community's critics and Ephesus, okay? Basically, that's a big fancy way of saying we've got John and his community, that's the church, we're gonna call it the Johannine community, um, and they're living there in Ephesus, in the church of Ephesus, and they are being uh, criticized by the Jews. And so John is writing his gospel to answer these things. Uh, they're definitely criticizing Jesus as the Messiah. And so we're gonna see that in response to this, there's going to be these different emphases in John's gospel about Jesus using particular Christological titles. Jesus really is the Messiah. He really is the son of God. He really is the savior. And so that emphasis is going to be high and strong in John's gospel in order to answer these Jewish critics. Okay. Um, a good place to start in looking at this is the obvious purpose statement in John's gospel. That's John 20 and verse 31. This is good. It's, it's very rare that we actually have a purpose statement in one of these gospels, but a purpose statement is going to tell us why it was written. So John 20, 31, which should be underlined and highlighted in all of your Bibles says this, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Okay, so these things, the things in the gospel were written so that you would believe, by the way, that's you in the plural, that's a second person plural, you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that you would have life in his name. Uh, Christ and Son of God are synonymous terms. To be the Messiah means that you are God's Son. And so whenever you read the gospel, of John, that is the conclusion you're supposed to arrive at, okay? He doesn't say that these things are written so that you would believe that Jesus is God in the flesh the second person of the Trinity, who is 100% God, 100% man. He doesn't say that. He says, you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God, someone distinct from God, but having a special relationship with God, okay? So we want to make sure that we have that understanding after reading the gospel. That's his purpose statement, okay? So we know that he's going to emphasize Jesus as the Christ, Christ is just the Greek word for Messiah, and he's going to emphasize Jesus as the Son of God, and that by believing these things, we're going to have life, life in his name. That's very clear. Okay, so number three, if the purpose was to defend Jesus' identity from Jewish critics, then this explains why certain titles for Jesus reappear so frequently, okay? <clears throat> so we're going to look at some of these titles. First one being Messiah. I found actually that when I looked at the data for this, this was really interesting. Um, maybe this is new to you. Maybe you already knew this. It's actually somewhat surprising is the fact that John's gospel has the only occurrences of Messiah in the entire New Testament. I don't know if you guys knew that. 
the only place where the Greek word messias occurs in the New Testament is in John's gospel. Now you will find the word Christ all over the, the New Testament, but the only time you'll find the word messiah as literally translated from the Greek word messias in the New Testament is only in John's gospel, not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, not in Acts, not in the epistles, not in the book of Revelation. So to me, that's interesting that John's gospel, regarded as the latest of the four, is still having to argue that Jesus is the Messiah so late in the first century, thus demonstrating to me that this was a live issue for John's critics. Okay, So John, being the latest gospel, is still having to argue against the opponents of Christianity that Jesus is the Messiah. So they're having to actually use this very Jewish title, for Jesus as the Messiah. They're having to like bring that out and it wasn't used anywhere else. So to me, it's very interesting that John has that emphasis and I wasn't aware of that until about 12 hours ago. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> we can look at those passages. Chapter one and verse 41, <clears throat> which says, uh, he, f uh, he found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. Now that phrase there in the parentheses uh, it's actually there in the text. Now, let me tell you, if, if you're a, 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 a Jewish person, you don't need to be told that Messiah is translated to mean Christ. You know that, okay? This is something that actually, when I read it, it tells me that uh, there's an emphasis in, in writing this towards people who are not Jews, okay? To say that Messiah means Christ is redundant if you're a Jewish person. You know that. That's part of like your ABCs that you're born with, okay? So this is an emphasis that's there. Christ is just the Greek word for Messiah. So, uh, but we have that emphasis there, but we also have a little indicator for us that, uh, that John is definitely written uh, to help educate people who are not born into Judaism, okay? Although people were, as we saw in the gospel, uh, they were kicked out of the synagogue, so uh, to me, it's, it, there's just evidence that the gospel is written to both Jews and Gentiles, okay? Uh, the next passage here is in 4, verse 25. It's very important that we pay attention to this because this is going to set the stage for a lot of arguments. In 425, this is Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, and after a long dialogue between the two of them, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah, there's that word, is coming, here's the parentheses, uh, he who is called Christ. Uh, when that one comes, he will declare all things to us, okay? So the, the Samaritan woman is looking for the coming of the Messiah, for the coming of Christ, okay? That's 4 and verse 25, the very next verse. Look at how Jesus answers this. This is extremely important. Please pay attention. 426, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Am he? Who, who is that he? Well, clearly in the context, it's the Messiah, the Christ, okay? But here in John's gospel, we have the very first occurrence of Jesus claiming to be the I am. That actually, you, you can't just translate it I am. You actually have to put a predicate at the after the end of the verb to be. And so it has to be I am he, and hopefully your translations have uh, am he. And so you have this Greek phrase, ego me, which means I am he. But it's very important here because what John's gospel is doing is it's giving us, it's introducing this phrase, I am. But I am here clearly, without any ambiguity, means I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. Not I am God. It means I am the Messiah. Okay? This is the first occurrence in John's gospel. And Jesus says that he is this, I am he, I am that one about whom you're speaking, in response to the woman's question about the Messiah. We know the Messiah is coming. Jesus says, I am he. I am that Messiah. Okay? So we can trace this phrase, I am he, meaning I am the Messiah, throughout John's gospel. And people don't do this. They don't notice that John has begun this, this title in this way. It has a very specific meaning, and that meaning has to be carried out throughout the rest of the gospel. So despite the fact that the noun Messiah only occurs twice in the New Testament, and twice in John's gospel here in 141 and 425. Jesus is now going to pick that up, and he's going to say that this phrase, I am, or I am he, is in reference to the Messiah. And so we can look at the rest of the passages and see this. So 8 verse 24, Jesus says, Therefore, 
I said to you that you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. There's that phrase, that go of me in Greek. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That means I am the Messiah, not I am God. I am the Messiah, because that's how that term was introduced in 426. We can move on, 828. So Jesus says, when you lift up the Son of Man, what is the Son of Man? The Son of Man is the messianic title for the apocalyptic judge. Then you will know that I am he. I am the Messiah. And I do nothing on my, on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. Okay? Notice, I am he is not I am God. It's I am the Messiah. Not when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am God. Son of Man and God are not the same thing. Son of Man is a messianic title, and Messiah is obviously the ultimate messianic title. It's the Messiah. And of course, you get to 858. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am he. Not I am God, but I am the Messiah. It's a reference to Messiahship. So the difficulty in this passage is not the reference of I am he, because John has already introduced very carefully that this means I am the Messiah. The difficulty in this verse is that Jesus was designated Messiah before Abraham was born, which is no big deal to us because the New Testament says that God had the plans of the Messiah in his mind, even from the creation of the world. So clearly um, that's before Abraham. Okay. Uh, 13 verse 19, Jesus said, from now on, I'm telling you before it comes to pass that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Believing, again, that I am the Messiah, that go in me. In the next passage in chapter 18, this is where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's about to be arrested. He comes there, and he is approached by uh, the guards with Judas. They answered him, because they're asking, um, uh, uh, you know, who are you looking for? They answered, uh, Jesus the Nazarene, and he said, Jesus said, I am he, I am the Messiah. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell on the ground. Therefore, he again asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these go their way. The conversation is not, whom do you seek? And they, did, and they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus did not respond, I am God. That makes no sense. It's ridiculous. They're not going to arrest God. Give me a break. Like, so the point is that, remember uh, the purpose statement of John, John 20, verse 31. These things were written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So here, Christ is the word Messiah. Messiah is introduced in John's gospel, the word there. And we see that Jesus continues to use this phrase, I am he, in reference to the Messiah. And you have to understand how John introduces this title. Otherwise, we've got all these people that think that Jesus is going around claiming to be I am, as if I am is the reference to I am of Exodus 3.14. By the way, I never understood how in chapter 8, verse 58, that's a passage where people like to make that connection. That connection is wrong. It doesn't make any sense for Jesus to say, before Abraham was born, I am from the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus is after Abraham. Why would he say, before Abraham was born, I am from the book that was written after Abraham died? That doesn't make any sense. But anyway, the point is, I am he, in John's gospel, is a messianic reference, a title to I am the Messiah, as demonstrated very clearly in 425 and 426. Okay? You will spend the rest of your life explaining that to your friends. It's not that difficult. Just follow the, 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 these verses here. It's, it's done in, uh, in an orderly fashion. Okay, so we got Messiah. Very clear that John has to make that emphasis there. Uh, also, we got the reference to Jesus being the Son. There's a tremendous emphasis on Jesus as Son of God in John. Remember uh, the purpose statement, John 20, verse 31. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Okay. Furthermore, God is called Father far more frequently in John then in the synoptics, notice 137 times in John, 63 times in Matthew, 56 times in Luke, and 18 times in Mark. Remember, Matthew and Luke are much bigger gospels than John, okay? And John has over twice as many references to Father than Matthew does, okay? So, of course, if the gospel of John has to emphasize Jesus as the real and authentic and true, legitimate and obedient son, 
then the reference to that son means that God really is the father and the father of Jesus, meaning um, that Jesus is the true son of that father. So that's why there is that emphasis, okay? So as son, Jesus faithfully obeys and represents the father. Got a lot of verses here. I'm going to uh, save my voice here, and I'm going to have, um, I'm gonna have my lovely wife do a little bit of a uh, reading for each of these passages. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yep, speak up here. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. All right. So we see here the, the birth of Jesus, that word was embodied, became flesh. It dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, and this glory is one of an only begotten from the Father. So we have someone who is uh, unique from the Father, and so there's that special relationship there. Okay? Jesus full of grace and truth. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Right. This is the testimony of John the Baptist. So it's not just Jesus testifying to us that he is the Son of God. We also have John the Baptist making this testimony. And you remember, if in Ephesus we have all of these people that were baptized by John the Baptist and they hold him in high regard, then certainly they would listen to the testimony of John the Baptist continually point people towards Jesus. John the Baptist testifies that Jesus is the Son of God, something we all already know anyway. Uh, 149. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Right. Notice there that uh, Jesus is called rabbi, means teacher. And uh, Jesus is the son of God. And notice son of God is synonymous with the king of Israel. Okay. You can get this reference in Psalm 2. Um, we have, you are my son today. I become your father. And also in 2 Samuel 7, where uh, the Davidic king is going to be called the son of God. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Okay. Notice the special relationship between the Father and the Son. The Father has given everything into the hand of the Son. Okay. So we're going to see Jesus claiming to have an awful lot of authority. Is Jesus claiming that uh, in a rebellious way? Is he trying to claim divine prerogatives from God that he doesn't have any business taking? No. On the contrary, God has given these things to the son rightfully and authoritatively because the father loves the son. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. Yeah. Okay. This is where people were accusing Jesus of, of uh, claiming some sort of equality with God. Remember the theme of misunderstanding? And so Jesus here corrects it. What, what is the sense of, of, uh, of equality with God? He, and he was saying this to them. That's what the passage is. He was saying this to them, meaning it was something that he was repeatedly saying to them over and over. Uh, son can't do anything of himself unless it's something he sees the Father doing. So Jesus is only obeying what the Father does first. But whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. So that like manner, that's the equality between the Father and the Son. It's the equality of the Son being obedient to what the Father is doing. That's the equality. Jesus can claim equality with God because he is obeying what God has done before him as an obedient and faithful Son. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. Right, okay. So in the Old Testament, you might get the impression that God is going to be the judge, but if God has handed over all judgment to the Son, then Jesus is now the authoritative judge. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Okay. Notice again, it's just the Father is continually giving over these privileges and these responsibilities to Jesus as the Son, so Jesus can do and say things that we might think, only the father is able to do. She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the son of God, he who comes into the world. Okay. Uh, it's very interesting here. This is actually uh, Mary who is making this uh, major Christological statement. Uh, notice again, Christ, the son of God, just like we saw in the purpose statement in 20 and verse 31. Um, so of course, Mary is the one that identifies Jesus clearly as the Messiah, <clears throat> the son of God. Okay. Uh, by the way, that phrase coming into the world, uh, that is a euphemism 
for being born, by the way. It's not coming into the world as in, I previously existed in heaven, and now I'm descending, coming into the world, meaning the third rock from the sun. That's not what uh, the world means there. Coming into the world is a reference to birth. We can actually see that um, both in John's gospel and in non-Christian Jewish literature, that coming into the world was a reference to birth. Um, you know, used to have my dad say that, oh, I brought you into this world. I can take you out of it, meaning, you know, I, you know, brought you in this world by birth and I could take you out of it, meaning not take you off of the planet earth, but, you know, remove your existence. So we still use that metaphor today. <clears throat> in 1127, isn't he talking to Martha instead of Mary? There's a, there's a, there's a Mary and Martha thing that's, uh, that's, that's going on there. Is, is it, did, did, am I mistaken? They're both, they're both there, but it seemed like the dialogue was with Martha. You, you might actually be correct there. Um, uh, the point, though, actually, is that um, uh, she makes this confession to where in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it seems that Peter is the one who makes the ultimate confession of Jesus being the Son of God. But, um, of course, the confession made here is in line with the uh, purpose statement confession in John 20 and 31. So uh, you might actually be correct there. Thanks for bringing that up. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. We, we do need to talk about this being the embodiment of the word, the embodiment of the logos, um, because I do find that people, uh, Christians, uh, still are not very comfortable reading and explaining John chapter 1 and what it actually means. But this is a major emphasis in John's gospel. It's not there in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so uh, instead of explaining the text away and saying, well, it doesn't mean this, 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 we need to actually say what it does mean. And we need to be comfortable with what it does say. So um, let's spend some time talking about this. Okay. So the opening prologue begins with the creative and powerful word in the beginning with God. Okay. So we can see that John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word. That is the word that was uh, with God from the beginning. And that word was uh, creatively and powerfully creating the world in the book of Genesis. This word, active in both creation and God's activity throughout history, it's important that we keep both those things in mind, gets embodied in the human Jesus in chapter 1 and verse 14, okay? Chapter 1 and verse 14, we already read, says the word became flesh, okay, and dwelt among us, okay? So that word became a human being. It gets embodied in this human being. That's when Jesus was born. That's when Jesus was literally brought into existence, so poetically, it says that that word became embodied in a human being and dwelt among us, okay? So if Jesus is the embodiment of God's word, and if God's word is the spoken word that God used to create the world and to carry out God's activities, then this actually gives the human Jesus the highest authority one can possess as a human being. It's a very um, exalted thing to say about Jesus. Um, so let's, let's look at, at some of these passages just to kind of make sense as to what's actually taking place here. Um, if this is not what uh, your translation says, these are just kind of my own translations here. So, of course, uh, John uh, 1, 1 through 3, we have in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was fully expressive of God. The point there in, at the end of verse 1 is that uh, that last phrase, God, is actually adjectival, meaning it's not functioning as a noun, it's functioning more as an adjective. Uh, the word is not one-to-one -one equated with God. The word is expressing God in almost like a godly fashion, okay? So the beginning of the word was the word up there in Genesis. That word was with God um, in the sense that it was closely related to him, although we don't speak this way today. I mean, when was the last time that your own spoken words were with you? We don't speak like that today. Uh, that phrase of God's words being with them uh, is quite frequent within the Old Testament, Okay, uh, we also see here that the word is highly being personified. It's being personified almost as a male figure. And so with poetry and personification, the word, which is a masculine noun in Greek, can be personified as a he. Note, just because it's personified doesn't mean that the word is a person. There's a difference. Okay, if I have a boat and I say, oh, this boat, she's my baby. It doesn't mean the boat is a woman. It just means that I personified this boat and I've, gave, I've given this boat female traits, okay? And so personification of God's word into a masculine figure doesn't mean it's a person. And so a lot of confusion goes on when we don't understand 
how personifications function. Uh, of course, I'm going to make the case that in the Old Testament, these personifications were already there. Okay, so he was in the beginning with God. That's not Jesus. It's not the Son of God. It's, it's the Word being personified as a male. Okay, verse 3, all things came into being through him, through the Word. Notice it's not the, the logos or the Word there is not the creator. It, it is the, the vehicle through which God is doing the creating. God is doing the creating through God's Word personified as a male figure and apart from him apart from the word nothing came into being that or, uh, yeah nothing came into being that has come into being point is everything that was created was made through god speaking into existence okay everything that's that was said there is is something that we can already see in the old testament john chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 is not telling us anything new from what is already taught in the old testament okay so we can see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Notice, here in Genesis, God speaks creation into existence, and God's words are so powerful, and God's words are so creative, that God speaks things, and they come into existence. Just like it says in John 1, 3, that all things came into being through him, through God's words. Here in Genesis 1, 3, God spoke, and there is creation. Very clear, okay? And of course, in the beginning is supposed to draw your mind and attention to the in the beginning of Genesis chapter one and verse one. Okay, another passage here, the very important one of looking at the, the sense of creation. Psalm 33 and verse six says, by the word of Yahweh, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Okay, so who does the creating here? Yahweh does the creating. How does he do it? Through his word. What is created? The heavens and all of their hosts. But notice, the word of Yahweh is synonymously set in parallelism to the breath of his mouth. Okay? So God speaks, and the heavens were created, and all of their hosts. But God's words are very similar to the breath of his mouth. Notice, the breath of God's mouth is not a separate person set alongside God. No, it's just God's spoken word that comes out of his breath. That's natural. Our words come from our breath. Okay, so again, we have the creation aspect there in Psalm 33, 6, just like we have in John 1, 3. All things came into being through him. Here we can see the heavens were made through the word. Okay, notice elsewhere here in the Old Testament, in, notice they're going to be in the Psalms. Psalms are going to be poetry, so we're going to expect a lot of um, metaphor. <clears throat> and this, look at what happens here in Psalm 107, verse 20. He, this is God, God sent his word and healed them, and it delivered them from their pits, from their pits of destruction, not their armpits, although I've met some people whose armpits are pits of destruction, but these, this actually meant like, like pits on the ground. <clears throat> okay, um, but notice God's, his word, it gets personified here. It's like God can actually send forth his word. God can speak it and send it forth almost as if the word is being personified here as something that can actually be sent with orders, and the word here is becoming obedient to God. And notice, it's that word that healed them and delivered them, okay? So we can see the personification of the word already here, and notice, not narrative portions of the Bible, but in poetry portions of the Bible. And if John 1, 1 through 18, if that prologue at the beginning of John isn't poetry, I don't know what it is. <clears throat> okay, elsewhere, Psalm 147, verse 15 and verse 18. It says, God, God sends forth his command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. Verse 18, he sends forth his word and melts them. Okay, so notice the word here is being sent, just like we saw in Psalm 107. And also the word is personified, and it's like the word, it's, it's running very quickly, very swiftly. Okay, so we're seeing here that the personification of God's word, again, not something brand new in John's gospel. It's already there in poetry sections of the Old Testament. And you can see that there. The word is almost like a personified figure that's running, and it's an obedient word that is sent multiple times in the Psalms. And then we can also see in Isaiah, and remember, by the way, that the prophets of the Old Testament, and what I mean by prophets are like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, um, the minor prophets, you know, Hosea, Joel, Obadiah, um, are two-thirds poetry. Prophets are two-thirds poetry, 
Okay, most people think the prophets need to be read literally, but actually the majority of them are meant to be read in poetry. Okay, so Isaiah writing in poetry, notice what it says here. This is God speaking. God says, so will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire, without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. So we can see here, God's word is going to bring about God's desire because the word is fully expressive of God, just like I translated in John 1, verse 1. It's being sent, just like we saw in the previous passages in Psalms, and it's being personified as something that is obediently coming forth from God's mouth. It's returning to God, doing what God desires as an obedient word, and it's going to succeed in the manner for which God sent it. So, in John chapter 1, when it gets personified, and it gets personified as a male figure, that's not something brand new, and we should not feel threatened by that, because the personification of God's word is already there in the Old Testament in multiple places. And so John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, is not saying, I'm going to repeat this, it's not saying anything new that you could not have already gleaned from teaching in the Old Testament. We should not feel threatened by what John 1 through 3 says because it was already stated in the Old Testament hundreds of years before. John's gospel is drawing on that clear Old Testament teaching and using it. And he's trying to use it to say, the whole, I think the entire purpose of the prologue of John's gospel is to say that the very same word that was active in creation, that's been active in God's activities, has now been embodied in the human Jesus and now Jesus has the authoritative word, and he's going around obediently speaking on behalf of God. And these words that Jesus, um, uh, these words that Jesus are speaking, they're not Jesus' own words. They're God's words. And therefore, Jesus has authority, and we better listen to Jesus because his words are the very words spoken from God. I think that's the point. The point is that the same word that was active in creation is now active in the ministry of Jesus. And that means that, hey, you Jews that are critics of the Gospel of John, you better listen to Jesus because he's not just some false Messiah that's claiming to be the Messiah. No, his teachings and his words and his commandments are the very words of God himself. I feel like I'm preaching at you all, but I'm very passionate about the subject. <clears throat> um, catch my breath here. Uh, we'll have some time to go over uh, some of these details at the very end. Um, I just want to make sure that I get through all of my slides. So just kind of withhold your questions for now. But um, to me, I think these are the best verses to look at to kind of explain uh, those particular points. Okay. Uh, Jesus as the obedient son. Uh, many of the criticisms of Jesus from the Jews, remember the Jews are the uh, primary opponents in the Gospel of John. So many of these criticisms indicate that they do not agree that Jesus was the Messiah because his claims and his deeds appear to make him out to be a foolish and rebellious son, okay? If Jesus is going around claiming to be the son of God and claiming that God is his own father, but Jesus is doing things like disobeying the Sabbath and eating with the wrong people and healing people on days that he's not supposed to heal on and claiming things um, regarding authority to forgive sins or claiming things like being the new temple, or claiming things um, like the, the, having the ability to heal that only God has, then Jesus is making God out to look bad, and Jesus is like actually looking to be a rebellious son. Okay, so I want you to kind of keep in mind um, how the Jews would understand the claims of Jesus as being a rebellious son, and why they would want to get rid of Jesus and kill him and stone him, or actually get him executed by the Romans because of the things that Jesus was saying. So look at how um, a rebellious son and how he dishonors the father uh, is taught and described in the book of Proverbs. Do you mind reading these passages? <clears throat> a foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her who bore him. Okay. So a foolish son is going to bring grief to the father and bitterness to the mother. That's in Proverbs 17. A foolish son is destruction to his father. Yeah. No, that's not good. It brings dishonor and destruction to the father. Uh, he who keeps the law is a discerning son, but he who is a companion of gluttons humiliates his father. Yeah, notice two things there, that if you're an obedient keeper of God's law, of God's Torah, 
then you are a discerning son that is not going to humiliate the father. But if you're a companion of gluttons, then you are going to humiliate the father. Guess what Jesus was accused of in his ministry? Being a companion of drunkards. Okay? So there's a lot of things that Jesus um, uh, 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 were, were saying and doing in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John that made Jesus appear to be someone who didn't care about the law. And so he looked like a false Messiah. And so you can understand how some Jews would say, well, I don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He looks like one of these false messiahs, one of these messianic pretenders. <clears throat> and, um, you know, Jesus in, in the uh, Gospels, particularly in Matthew 24, he actually warns us. He says to beware of false Christ, beware of false messiahs. And we know from history that 100 years before the birth of Jesus and 100 years after the birth of Jesus, so that 200-year span, that we have a dozen, count them, 12 different persons that popped up claiming to be the Messiah. Of course, 11 of them were false, but these I mean, that was a time that was ripe with people claiming to be false messiahs, and actually, they persuaded many. They actually would get lots and lots of fathers, not fathers, followers, excuse me. <laughs> I'm reading the word father here. Um, so false messiahs were out there, and so for many of the Jews that were opponents of Jesus in the uh, Gospel of John, they're just saying that Jesus is a false messiah. He's just like any of these other messianic pretenders, <clears throat> and uh, his um, false teachings that are leading these poor disciples that later became apostles astray, um, uh, deem him worthy of death. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, Jesus is not a rebellious son. Jesus is an obedient son. <clears throat> Uh, so John's gospel therefore goes out of its way to prove that Jesus is not making disobedient claims about himself, but rather was an obedient and thereby genuine son of the father. Okay. So one of the emphases in John's gospel is trying to demonstrate Jesus is not disobedient. Jesus is not rebellious, but in fact, Jesus is obedient and thereby he is the true and authentic son of God. And he's not dishonoring the father. In fact, he is bringing honor to the father. But that emphasis is so heavy in the Gospel of John because it's come under attack by the Jews there in Ephesus. Okay? Um, actually, I can get someone else actually to read that. Anyone want to read the passages on this particular slide? Okay, I see someone raise their hand there. I'll do it. What okay. is it? 530. Okay. Okay. I do have them on the screen if you just want to read them off of there. Oh, I can read it on there. Okay. I can do nothing on my own initiative, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That's right, okay? <clears throat> Jesus says, I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me, because Jesus is obedient, and he does nothing of his own initiative. <clears throat> um, and what, what's actually interesting <clears throat> is that there's, a, there's actually a, a commentator um, uh, named uh, C.K. Barrett, uh, who wrote in this commentary uh, in, in reference to chapter 5, verse 30, he says, is Jesus really claiming that he is God, but as God, he does what he's told? And he's, he's saying that in a way to kind of like nudge at people who go to the Gospel of John and claim that Jesus is constantly claiming to be God. But he's like, Jesus is, is the obedient son in the Gospel of John instead. So it's just kind of interesting. Okay, uh, 6 and verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Right, okay. Now, some people say, oh, looky there, Jesus came down from heaven. But Jesus rarely, in the Gospel of John, speaks literally, okay? Uh, James chapter 1 says that every good thing given and every perfect gift comes down from above. Everything given. So that baby being born right now in the hospital, you can say, came from heaven. It has come from God, okay? Uh, John chapter 1 and verse 6 says, John the Baptist was sent from God. Not literally from heaven, but he was authorized by God. John the Baptist's baptism was from heaven. So uh, this language of being from heaven is not necessarily a location, literally descending from heaven. It's an identification. If you've come down from heaven, that means that you're truly identified with God. Because Jesus said that, uh, the Pharisees, they were from below, not that they were born from the ground, but that they were identified with the thing that was the opposite of heaven, which is the world in need of redemption. Uh, 7 verse 16. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Right. Notice there the, the obedience there. Jesus is obediently teaching, not his own teaching, but the teaching that belongs to the Father. 
uh, 8, verse 28 through 29. I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. He, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Right. What, what a great example for us. Can we sit there and say that we always do the things that are pleasing to the Father? I mean, that's, that's something that Jesus could say there. That's, it's very powerful. But he's like, I don't do anything on my own initiative. I only do the things that are pleasing to God. I mean, that's, that's an obedient son emphasis. 8 verse 42. I've not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Right. Okay. So God sent him, meaning God commissioned Jesus authoritatively. Uh, Jesus not doing his own thing. He's not a rebellious son. He's being obedient to the Father. Uh, 10, 17 through 18. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Right. Okay, so the authority that Jesus has to lay down his life and to take it up again is the authority that he received from the Father. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and uh, no one can take that away from Jesus because God gave it to him. Um, continuing on, I got more verses. 10 verse 38. But if I do them, though you do not believe... Uh, believe me believe the works so that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I am the father. Right. Okay. So he's like, Hey, believe my miracles, believe my works because the father is in me doing this, but it's not just the father is in Jesus. Jesus and the father, this is mutual and dwelling between the two of them. They are so closely connected because again, Jesus is an obedient, faithful son, not a disobedient, rebellious son. Uh, 1249 through 50. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that, this command, that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Right. I speak just as the Father has told me. Okay. He doesn't speak on his own initiative. God has given the commandment as to what to say and what to speak. Really, what to say and what to speak are really two ways of saying the same thing. Uh, 14 verse 10. <clears throat> uh, the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Right. And we get the point. I mean, it's just saying the same thing over and over. 1431. So that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Right. Okay. So do you see this emphasis over and over and over and over and over again that Jesus has to defend himself. I mean, John's gospel has to defend Jesus against these claims of the Jews that are saying he's a false Messiah because he looks like a disobedient and rebellious son. So Jesus has to continually say, I'm obedient. I don't do anything by myself. I only do what the Father says. Uh, I'm, and I'm, I'm loyal to that. That emphasis is there so strongly to make that case because, because John's a polemical gospel. It has to argue and make that point against its opponents. Oh, I got one more. How about that? 1632. You're not off the hook yet, Lisa. Okay. He's changing the slat. Or, it's, it's hiding. There oh, there it is. Oh, okay. I am not alone because the Father is with me. Right. Okay. Um, Jesus is never alone. The Father is always with him because Jesus is not a rebellious son. Okay. Um, <clears throat> John's literary freedom to rearrange. Okay. This is something that uh, we... we we're going to need to pull out our Bibles. We're going to need to look at these passages here. Okay, so um, this is probably uh, probably the most controversial thing I'm going to say today. Although you never know what's going to rub people the wrong way. Um, but this is this is the last point of the uh, set of slides. Okay, um, so this is going to help us to understand something about the Gospel of John and where it puts particular points. So, uh, as an author of a Greco-Roman biography. John exercised his right to rearrange the stories about Jesus for his own theological and authorial purposes. In other words, John's theology and literary agendas were more important than strict chronological adherence. And I'm going to give some examples here. But you can see, we already talked about this when we looked at Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We noticed that they could reorganize the stories of Jesus. They could put them maybe in a different order. And they weren't so concerned with uh, strict chronological adherence. They were more concerned with themes. They were more concerned with um, 
uh, a deliberate organization. A good example is looking at Matthew. In Matthew chapter 13, you have nothing but parables. You have seven parables on the kingdom of God, okay? And then in Matthew, I guess it's, uh, I think it's like Matthew chapter 9, you have nothing but healing stories, okay? And in Matthew chapters uh, 24 and 25, you have nothing but uh, teachings on the second coming. And if you read that chronologically and woodenly literal, you would get the impression that, wow, Jesus, all he did one day was heal. And all he did one day is teach parables on the kingdom. And all he did on another day is talk about the second coming. But it's not very likely that, that happened because in Luke, those are all broken up into different places. It's likely that Matthew has organized and said, okay, let's give parables of the kingdom. Let's clump them all up into chapter 13. Let's take healing stories. Let's clump them all up into here to make a point. Teachings on the second coming, let's, let's, let's gather them all up into chapter 24 and 25. Okay, we know that Luke tells us in his prologue that he is putting things in his own order, in his own in his own particular order, so that he can write for his own purposes. Okay, so this is not anything that should catch us off guard. Okay, the point is we we know this. We know that Greco-Roman biographies had the authority to reorganize the stories so they could tell the story however they want it. Okay, and so we're going to look at some examples here. Okay, so. Um, I need somebody to read John chapter 5 and verse 1 and also John chapter 6 and verse 1. And let's try, let's try to get someone who hasn't read yet. I got John 5 verse 1. Okay. I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Go for it's it. just that one verse. Uh, actually, if you could read John 5 1 and John uh, 6 1, please. Oh, and 6 1. Excuse me. Please. Um, okay. I, thought, I meant in that chapter, but that's fine. Um, after this, a Jewish festival took place and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Okay. So all of John chapter five is taking place at this particular festival in Jerusalem. Okay. Remember Jerusalem is the capital in the region of Judea and that the entire chapter takes place in that same place. Okay. So now read John chapter six and verse one. Okay. John six, verse one. After this, Jesus crossed the sea of Galilee or type, excuse me, Tiberus. That's all that's that it. says. That's all that verse one says. Uh, verse two says a huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing by healing the sick. Let me make sure I have that. Correct. Um, okay, so my, mine in chapter six and verse one says, after these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias, okay? The point is there in chapter 6 and verse 1, the impression you get is that Jesus is in Galilee going from one side of the sea to the other, okay? But the Sea of Galilee is not there in Jerusalem. The point is chapter 5 seems to presuppose a contained unit of Jesus at a festival in Jerusalem, and chapter 6 presupposes a setting in Galilee, and those are two separate places. The point is these two chapters are not giving us the chronology of one happening right after the other. They're really kind of their own self-sustained stories um, that really could be put anywhere in the gospel, okay? So they're, they're, they're contained units that are unrelated to chronology because uh, chapter 6 and verse 1 um, presupposes that Jesus is no longer in uh, Jerusalem, okay? Um, someone read uh, John 14, verse 31, please. Um, I can get that too if you want. Go for it. Okay. Verse 1431 says, <clears throat> on the contrary, so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do as the Father commanded me. Get up, let's leave this place. Yeah, he says, get up, let's leave this place, or get up, let's be on our way. Despite the fact that there are three more chapters afterwards of instruction and prayer. He doesn't get up and go to the Garden of Gethsemane then, but you get the sense that it's like, get up, let's go. But then you have 15, 16, and 17 of still more instructions of Jesus privately there with him, okay? Um, so the point is, like, it's that, that kind of sounds like that's supposed to be the end of that, but there's still more instruction that's there because John had more that needed to be said. And there's a lot of important teaching about um, what to do after Jesus ascends to heaven about the Holy Spirit. Um, John chapter 17 is the longest prayer in the Bible. So um, you get the sense there that that, that phrase obviously doesn't work chronologically. 
Um, okay, how about this one? Now, John places the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This is in John chapter 2, okay, where Jesus goes into the temple with the whips and overturns the tables and everything, okay? And so John wants to do this in order to argue that Jesus is the true locus of God's temple presence, while the synoptics note that this episode occurred on the final week of Jesus' ministry, okay? So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it happens at the end of Jesus' ministry, but John has taken the same, same episode, and he's put it at the beginning of Jesus' ministry because for him, he needs to make the point that Jesus can overturn the temple, and he has authority in the temple because he is the true temple. He has to make that, that, uh, that statement early in his gospel. Um, people who have not understood that, that the gospel writers can rearrange their sources have uh, stated wrongly, in my opinion, uh, that Jesus cleansed the temple twice. Unfortunately, if that was true, then John would say that Jesus cleansed the temple again towards the end of his ministry. But no gospel says that Jesus cleansed the temple twice. Matthew says it happened once. Mark said it happened once. Luke says it happens once. And John says it happens once. But the point is, John is just kind of put at the beginning of his ministry because his theology and his literary agenda is more important than chronology. <clears throat> okay? Um... This one here, actually, I'm not, I'm not actually sure on. This is kind of a, this is a possible one, uh, so I'm not hinging my argument on it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Luke, uh, Luke's gospel has a story of a, uh, there's a large fish catch in chapter 5, which is before the resurrection, while John's version of this in chapter 21 happens after the resurrection. Um, again, that's possible. I'm not making a big issue on that, and I might be wrong on that. But to me, it just seems very interesting that uh, a story like that can be, um, if it's true, uh, rearranged so casually. Uh, a couple others here. Um, let me actually get someone to read John chapter 2 and verse 11. I'll do it. <clears throat> this beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Okay, so that was the, the first sign that Jesus did there. It's not the beginning. It, it's actually uh, the word for the first, uh, the first one that he did. Um, can you also read, or somebody, can somebody read 4 and verse 54? I don't mind doing that again. Uh, 4, 54. Mm -hmm. Give me just two seconds. I'm almost there. Okay, 4, 54 says, Now this was also the second sign Jesus performed after he came from Judea to Galilee. Okay, so we got the first sign uh, in 2.11. We got the second sign in 4 and verse 54. And then um, uh, somebody read chapter 2 and verse 23. I got it. I'm there. Okay. While he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. Yeah, notice the signs that he was doing. Um, so you can see there, if the first sign was at the beginning of chapter 2, and if the second sign was in 454 at the end of chapter 4, then you've got this reference here to other signs that he was doing there. The point is, like, the, these stories are, don't work chronologically. They've, just been, they've been put into different places in order for John to make his own point. Um, so I put, um, um, there's just other signs that are there. Okay. And again, I'm not suggesting these are contradictions at all. I don't think these are contradictions, period because I don't think that John was meant to be read in a woodenly literal chronological fashion. Uh, if you think that they're, if it should be written chronologically, then they become problems for you. This is actually an answer to the issue of, of these problems, is that they're not meant to be read chronologically. They're just purposeful storytelling uh, in deliberate places. Okay, um, somebody read John 2 verse 23, please. I got it. <clears throat> now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, seeing his signs that he was doing. That's what I just read. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's, that's right. You're good. You're good. It, it, it's part of building off this next point here. Okay. So oh, as okay. Jesus is there in Jerusalem, so I'm making a different point from this verse. <clears throat> uh, Jesus is there in Jerusalem. So chapter three is dialogue with Nicodemus. Um, which says that uh, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, um, is also there taking place presumably in Jerusalem. <clears throat> uh, but then you got 
uh, at the end of that passage in 3 and verse 22, um, something a little different. So could somebody read 3.22, please? So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Yeah, I think you're not in uh, 322. You might be in. Oh, yeah. I have it. In, after, these, after, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. <clears throat> yeah, notice right there, it's like they came into the land of Judea, but if the end of chapter two and all of chapter three just far is chronologically literal, then he was already in Judea for the, for the Passover and they're talking to Nicodemus. So you can see there that it's like this, this new section here in 322 presupposes that it didn't chronologically happen afterwards because he's already there. <clears throat> Again, we don't read these things very carefully because one, we're just not really good with maps and two, we just don't really care about these details too often. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> this one's a little easier. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. John 13, 36 has Peter saying, where are you going? Later in 14, verse 5, Thomas says that we do not know where you're going. And yet 16, verse 5 records Jesus saying, none of you ask me, where are you going? Well, okay, well, he says that, but previously Peter and Thomas had already said, where are you going? And asked that question. Um, so you can see that obviously chapter 16 was not meant to be put chronologically after those things. Otherwise, it just doesn't make any sense there. <clears throat> so again, I say this, I'm not trying to point out things that are contradictions. These aren't contradictions because gospels were not meant to be read in a woodenly chronological fashion. We can see that these are just a variety of stories, excuse me, a variety of stories that are put in different places so that uh, John can make his own theology and make his own arguments, okay? It's only when we read them chronological that these problems begin, but it's not meant to be read chronologically. It's just a variety of stories, um, like any other um, biography you would write, okay? <clears throat> um, let me pause right here before I click one more time, uh, because I need to make sure that I've established this point before I can make my next point. Um, any, uh, any, any comments or, or well, well, let me just ask, like, is, is, is this evidence persuasive, or how, how do you feel about this? Anybody? I think it's very persuasive. I think you've done a very good job in presenting this information, really. Okay. Do you, uh, just ask you? I, I think the one especially that, that establishes the point is the cleansing of the temple because it's so radically different than the other gospels. Okay. Well, here's the thing. If I can get you to see that, number one, correct Roman biographies had the right and authority to rearrange stories and two, that John is more concerned with his theology than he's concerned with writing chronology. Then this next point is going to make sense, okay? And this is, so, so buckle up. Here's, here's the most controversial thing I'm going to say here, okay? In order to stress the theology that Jesus is the true Passover lamb, John reorders the chronology of Jesus' death to coincide with the time that the regular Passover lamb was slaughtered. Somebody actually read here, John chapter 19 and verse 14. Dustin, can you say that again? Just that last sentence, I think it's powerful. Okay, in order to stress the theology that Jesus is the true Passover lamb, John reorders the chronology of Jesus' death to coincide with the time that the regular Passover lamb was slaughtered. So in order to prove this, I need someone to read John 19 and verse 14. I got that. Now, it was the preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And right. he says to the Jews, look at your king. Right. Notice, it's the time. that's the time right there when Jesus dies in John's gospel is the time of the preparation of the Passover. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the, the, the disciples eat at the preparation of the Passover the day before Jesus dies. And you can see that, with that uh, in this passage here in Luke 22, verses seven through nine. Let me get somebody to read that, please. Uh, 
I'll read it. Uh, In the day of unleavened bread came when the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover meal for us so we can eat it. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. Yeah. Go and prepare this. Where do you want to prepare it? It's the Passover lamb. This is the day before Jesus is crucified. And that's the same story in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay. So the point here is that You can't take Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John and their chronology of the death of Jesus and lump them all together and come out with a coherent story. It doesn't work, okay? Because John has Jesus dying at a very specific time because he's trying to emphasize that Jesus is the Passover lamb. That's part of his theology. And so for him, making the theology that Jesus is the real Passover lamb and that Jesus' death occurs at the same time that everyone else is killing the Passover lamb is more important for him than the actual day and time when Jesus was historically killed. Okay. And he has the authority to do that because we've seen in a half dozen other occurrences that he's already rearranged his gospel to make his own theological points. And so this this is why I think um, using John for the chronology um, is, is misusing him in the way that he was intending to be uh, read. So, Anyway, let that think about it, but I just know a lot of people are kind of raised on particular systems that um, have used John's chronology in a way that it was not intended to be read. So, okay, so let's wrap things up, wrapping things up, drawing conclusions. What is everything we've looked at so far, okay? (laughs) Uh, I don't know how in the world I'm able to wrap everything up in one slide. Number one, it was John the Apostle who penned the fourth Christian gospel apart from the literary influences of the synoptics. After his death, Members of his church community rounded out and edited the gospel into what we have today. Okay, number two, this gospel was written in and to the church in Ephesus, a church comprised of both Jewish and Gentile believers in Jesus. We know this from uh, within uh, the gospel because it has references to Jews being kicked out of the synagogue. um, And we have references to basic Jewish words being translated into Greek for a Greek speaking audience. Uh, we also know this outside because we know that the Ephesian church um, was had Jews and Gentiles in from the book of Acts and from a variety of other places in the New Testament. Okay, Some within the church were formally kicked out of the synagogue upon converting to Christ. We can see that in John's gospel in three particular places. Number three, John's gospel was fiercely polemical, meaning argumentative from a apologetic standpoint. Answering the Jewish critics at the end of the first century regarding the validity of Jesus as Israel's Messiah. How does it go about doing this? Well, Jesus was the authentic son of God, the father, obeying him at every step and validly exercising his God-given prerogatives. Jesus could heal on the Sabbath because he had the authority to do so. Jesus could forgive because he had the authority to do so. Jesus could judge because he, he had the authority to do so. Jesus could speak the very words of God because he had the authority to do so. Both John the Baptist and Jesus made positive claims of Jesus' messiahship, okay? That's there. Instead of dishonoring the Father, Jesus always obeyed his will. So he was an obedient son. Jesus' authority comes from the fact that his words and commandments are truly from God. And John's gospel begins by noting that Jesus is the embodiment of God's creative and powerful word. The word became flesh. And as the climax of Judaism, Jesus is the true temple, the true vine, and the true Passover lamb. And the fourth gospel rearranged its contents in order to highlight these key theological points. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, let's open it up for questions. I know I put a lot on the table there, but uh, I want you all to get your money's worth. Um, I just, I don't know if this is a question, but it's more of a statement. I just think I'm never going to read the book of Ephesians. I, I put this down in the comment section too, but I know you can't necessarily see that as a teacher and with a slide up, but I don't think I'll ever quite read Ephesians the same way again, <laughs> knowing, yeah. you know, that that's kind of where John was and where he was writing to and from. It just adds more depth to yet another book. I know we're talking about John, not trying to change the subject or anything, but just side note, I thought, oh, now every time I read Ephesians and I read John, I'll kind of 
closely relate them as we say in the South, like kissing cousins. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, I hate to burst your bubble there, but actually the book of Ephesians was probably not written to the church of Ephesus. It, uh, the phrase in the, at the beginning of that epistle where it says to Ephesus is actually mentioned or it's missing from all its early manuscripts. So it's probably a circular letter that was sent to a lot of different people, uh, not specifically to Ephesus. And it was just eventually through tradition given to Ephesus there. Um, Weird. You know, yeah, that's a, I thought that was pretty common knowledge actually, but all your Bibles will say in that, in the opening of, of Ephesians, that the phrase to Ephesus is missing from all its early manuscripts. So, but that's another, another conversation for another time. Yep. Okay. So the, the, the irony is that you actually learn more about the church of Ephesus from the book of Revelation than from Ephesians. That's the real irony. I think I read an article some time back that was something about the Laodiceans. Was it, was it about Ephesians? What well, some, pe some people um, speculate that, that that letter is the letter that Paul talks about in a different letter uh, that the, the letter to the Ephesians was actually the letter to the Laodiceans. Yeah. That the interesting thing about Ephesians is that it has no personal greetings. And we know from the book of Acts that Paul has been to Ephesus and he knows people by name. And it actually has no controversy that Paul is, is answering. Every other letter of Paul has a controversy that Paul's answering. There's no controversy in Ephesians and there are no personal greetings. So we need to kind of take that. It might, that right there might lend credence to the argument that was probably intended to be a more general circular letter rather than a specific letter to a specific audience. But like I said, that's another, another conversation for another time. I really loved your uh, <clears throat> teaching on the, the opening of the gospel and explaining the personification of the word, a big blessing. It really explains a, explains a lot of controversy away. <laughs> you can understand that uh, figure of personification of the word. Mm. Yep. I, I, I agree. I, I just wanted to say that that is the best explanation I ever heard. I mean, it really is. I've heard a lot of people talk about it, but you did it, you presented it so well. And I'm, you know, I just think that was really done very well. Thank you. And to back it up with, and to back it up with the Old Testament, that, that concept of personification of the word, the spoken word, the, the word of God. It was already a known thing to wait, to refer to God's word. Yeah. On that same note, I think it helps how you backed up what you were saying about personification. You just didn't say, hey, this is personification. You used several Old Testament verses in the Psalms and that kind of thing to show many other ways that the same word was also used as personification. Gives a lot of credibility to your point. <clears throat> and more than just one place. Well, I, I do this because there's been a uh, there's been a knee jerk reaction among biblical Unitarians, and they want to translate it as a, with a, with a neuter pronoun it, um, like depersonifying the word. And, right. And I don't think that's what I think John intended it to be a personification. Um, and and if, if if John intended for it to be a personification, and we translate it and we depersonify it, then we've actually changed what God was trying to teach people in that gospel um, and so I will I will argue for the personification as the correct interpretation probably till the day that I die but again <laughs> a personification of the word doesn't mean the word is an actual person conscious up there with God alongside next to him okay no more than your words are a separate person from yourself your words are a reflection of who you are hopefully hopefully you say what you mean and you mean what you say Right. I kept thinking of like the book of um, so or Proverbs, excuse me, how, you know, personification of wisdom and the personification of fool is called a woman and of a fool is called a woman several times. Yeah. Well, it, it uses, it uses uh, the feminine pronoun she, <clears throat> because the, the word for wisdom in Hebrew, Hokma, is a feminine noun. So you would, uh, they personify it based on the, the grammatical gender of the word. So logos is, is masculine, so it gets personified as a male. And uh, wisdom gets personified as a female because it's grammatically feminine. That's the title. That's so interesting to me that like wisdom is just 
from, from a female standpoint that woman is known so much as wisdom that she's personified as one, but that men are, are known so much as being like the logical one that they're given the word logos. I think that's really fascinating. Does that make sense? Uh, it, I don't think that it's, it's necessary. Well, here, here's the interesting thing is that uh, I didn't have time to go and do this, but there are a lot of things that are said about Jesus um, in the gospel of John that are actually said about the personification of wisdom in Proverbs and a lot of other places. So John's gospel could still say that Jesus is the embodiment of wisdom. So I, I actually think, and a lot of scholars also think that that's a, that was an intended argument as well. Um, I just, I had so much other stuff I wanted to say today that to me, that was kind of like secondary and in, in importance. Right. No, for sure. That's, that, that is interesting as well. I was just saying from a personal standpoint, I think it's interesting that biblically they did that. They separated woman as wisdom and man as logic. Yeah. Men are logical, women are wise. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. You gotta be careful there because the, uh, the, the, uh, the the adulterous woman or is 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 a is a female in proverbs it's never a male so we got to be careful there that's not very wise <laughs> <laughs> uh greg and julie got their hand up okay i i don't i wanted to ask this question but it's not about anything that you talked about today but it's in the gospel of john it's it's and i don't know if you <laughs> It's when Jesus Christ is talking to Nicodemus. Uh huh. Um, when he is speaking, you look and it's in chapter three, verse eleven. Starts with ten, okay, and then Jesus is talking and he's saying, "If I told you the earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things?" Then verse seven, there, thirteen, verse thirteen says, "No one has ascended into heaven." Uh -huh but he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And then it goes on. Mm -hmm. So I, can you explain that? I've heard different explanations about this. Yeah. Because at this time he had not ascended into heaven. Uh, you're reading it literally and you're reading it outside of oh. context. So, okay. so let's, let's, can you let's just, look at this. Let's, yeah. uh, as, as you, that you actually read the appropriate context. That actually is what is needed to help us. Okay, so let's let's look there. Uh, John chapter three. When you see this, you're gonna be like, oh wow, this is so simple. <clears throat> okay, so um, um, obviously Jesus is teaching Nicodemus, and he doesn't understand these things. Okay, um, so verse twelve, he says, "If I told you earthly things and you don't believe." How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Okay. So earthly things are just things that are involved. They're just kind of in the basic sphere of this world. Heavenly things are the things of God. They're like God's special knowledge, God's special teachings. Okay. So heavenly things there, they're not things that are in heaven in a location standpoint. They're heavenly things as in heavenly is identifying them. So it's identification, not location. So heavenly things there are identification. So the very next verse Heavenly is going to be identification. No one has ascended into heaven, and no one has ascended to understand these heavenly things, the mind of God, except for the Son of Man who has descended from heaven to tell you these things. Okay? So it's not about location, it's about identification. So that's when Jesus comes from God, it's not location, he comes from God in an identification standpoint. Okay, good. That explains yeah, it. So, so actually the key thing is actually just reading verse 12 and carrying that definition of earthly to heavenly into the very next verse. Okay, thanks. Sure. I've always taken to the, um, you know, it seems to me that in, by the time you get to verse 16, Jesus is no longer speaking, that the writer is speaking, and that 13 is is a, a possible place where that begins so he picks up where uh, you know jesus you know tells nicodemus what he tells him in verse 12 and then we're going to get commentary on that beginning in 13. yeah i think so the, obviously the narrator has we it's clear he's picked up in, in 16 
And so we can ask the question, when does it pick up earlier than that? Um, and so uh, I think 13 is, is pretty logical there as well. Okay. Well, wait a minute. So, so are, what do you, I understand what John's saying, because that's what I, somebody taught me. <laughs> about yeah, I, that yeah I, I think that, that makes sense. So it could be that the that the author picked up there instead of Jesus Christ doing the speaking. Is that what you're saying? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I don't okay. think that it matters one way or another. I mean, okay, um, all right. Yeah, it doesn't really change what Dustin said about what verse thirteen means. It um, it's just I, I I see it as commentary that that yeah, the yeah. author has has finished quoting Jesus and now he's going to give us commentary on what Jesus was talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I, that's what I had been taught that I just was trying to get some other insight on it. Okay. Fine. Yeah. You're right. It doesn't change anything though. Okay. Yeah. Cause there are a lot of people actually in the first century that claim to ascend to heaven to get all the secret knowledge from God. Uh, but John's gospel saying actually the only person who has that special knowledge of God is actually Jesus. Um, and so it's, it's, a uh, it's receiving that, um, having that kind of like connection, I guess you could say. So, but, but it's metaphor. It's not meant to be read literally. So, um, question about, about what you were saying about the Jesus and the being the Passover lamb. So one gospel is saying that he was present at the Passover and then and then yeah. John saying yeah so if you, if you read Matthew Mark and Luke uh, the preparation of the Passover happens on Thursday uh, Jesus crucified on Friday and he's raised on the third day which is Sunday morning um, but in John's gospel Jesus is crucified at the time of the preparation of the Passover okay um, so obviously those chronologies don't work and so but, but that's because John's not intending to write deliberately chronological he's writing theological because he's making that point that jesus is the passover lamb which is not a point that matthew mark and luke are trying to make um, the the other gospel not john but the other one which gospel is that and where is it luke? i read out of luke but 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 they all share the same chronology matthew mark and luke all do the same thing where in luke is it luke 22 i think it was like seven through nine or something okay you have to look at that out of your own time, but um, that's 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 the key to unlocking that problem is is realizing that John is putting his theology over his chronology. I think the problem with that that particular view is that I I I, I, I don't think it's even controversial the idea that that John is reordering his chronology. The problem I I have with it with this that particular thing that you uh, you said. Uh, was that it doesn't just change the chronology. It actually makes John wrong um, in what he's saying. Uh, because he's, he's making, he's not just making chronology statements. He's making the case that they wanted Jesus pulled down because the next day um, uh, was a high, a special Sabbath day. Right, because that's what John says. It wasn't just a regular Sabbath. The next day was a special Sabbath, um, and John is intending to say, uh, "What I read is that John's saying that the next day is the Passover that that begins that evening." And so, uh, you know, I, I do realize, I do recognize that the, you know this is a challenge. This particular thing is a challenging thing to resolve because the other Gospels do seem to say that that they were headed into the Passover you know, days before. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd want to see a different way of resolving that than, than he's just rearranging his chronology because he's saying that the next day is the Passover. Um, and that's not true. Well, hold on. Um, well, well, John's gospel says that Jesus was killed at the preparation of the Passover and that the next day was the Sabbath. So from John's perspective, Jesus is still dying on Friday, and the next day is still Saturday. No, he, he doesn't just say it's a Sabbath. He says it's a special Sabbath. I get it, but Sabbath is still Saturday. 
Well, no, what I'm saying is, let me go. The Passover it. didn't always fall on Saturday, did it? Well, it doesn't matter whether it's on Saturday or, or not. The, the, the point is, is that the next day, uh, where was that verse? Uh, it's down here in John 19 someplace. Yeah, here we go. So since it was the preparation day, uh, here, and I'll read out the New American Standard so the old Christian will take liberty sometimes. Uh, then the Jews, because it was the day of, of preparation so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. Um, so it was, it was a high Sabbath, not just a regular Sabbath. I get that, but Sabbath is still Saturday, always. That is the day Saturday. No, no. the The high Sabbaths are the are the feast day. So Passover. That's right. It's right. Saturday. It's a high no, Sabbath. You know, no, it, it, it's, it's, it was the it was the fifteenth of Nisan. Well, no, no. My my point is not about which day it's on. My point is that is that John is saying that the day following is the Passover day. But that would make what, uh, but the other gospels, if they're saying. Jesus and the disciples ate the Passover, mm -hmm. then the Passover actually happened before his crucifixion. And John is saying it happened after his yeah, crucifixion. Yeah, that's the point. That, that, that's the issue at hand. So the way that it gets resolved, and here's the thing. If, if we're coming to this and we are having a problem with the chronology, that's the problem that we're bringing to the text because we are coming to it and asking chronological questions that John is not trying to answer himself. He is more concerned with the theology that Jesus is the Passover lamb. That is not an emphasis in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so John goes out of his way to do all of these things to make Jesus being the true Passover lamb, which for him is more important than his chronology. So for him, the chronology is not the real issue there. The issue is really, is Jesus the true Passover lamb? And we need to allow John to make his case and to make his argument and to not be upset at chronology, because as we've seen throughout all of his gospel, he, he couldn't care less about his chronology, because that's not the most important thing for him. I'm still going to want to look for a different answer, because to me, it's not, about, it's not about chronology, it's about John being wrong, um, because it's not, it, I get it that if he's reordered things, like moving this, a story around with this, this happening, or where it picks up, that was really interesting what you showed about how You've got one chapter where he's in Jerusalem, and then the next chapter begins where he goes into Judea. It's like, wait a minute, he's already in Judea. You know, uh, that I, I get that. But to actually make the statement that, that um, Jesus was, was crucified on the day before the high Sabbath, and where the other Gospels, if they're, if they're saying what, Here's me saying because maybe they're the ones that were God damn. is that they're um, they're saying he was uh, he actually ate the Passover. Then you don't just have a chronology problem, in my opinion. You actually have a an event problem. Well, the point is, if if you are like I said, and and you know this is something you have to think about for yourself for some time. We're not going to be able to settle it all here. Sure. But if you're concerned with the chronology problem, then you would have had concerns throughout John's gospel before you got to John chapter 19. Mm -hmm. But again, all the gospels say that Jesus was crucified on that Friday, the next day was the Sabbath, and the third day he rose. Okay, so that's the same in all of them. The only thing that's different is that the, the, the day of the Passover is different between the synoptics and John. But again, John has already demonstrated that it, this is the point that I keep trying to make, is that his theology is more important than chronology. And we need to allow John to make his argument there. That's that's more important to him. So um, like I said, we're not gonna be able to settle it all now. No, no, that, that's no. what I think is, is is the best answer for it there. I'll tell you what is not the right answer is, is harmonizing all of them together. That doesn't work. And I'm, I'm just gonna say right now, that's not the way that needs to be done. So. Before I uh, say God bless and goodbye to everybody, I'd like to draw attention to Dan of California, of his previous post very, very at the beginning, the, about his twins. One has evidently died, Dan, 
and then the other one is very sick, and you were asking for prayers for that. So um, I lift to you, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Dan's um, twin that is very sick. And I ask that you would comfort their hearts about the loss of the other twin, that you be in this whole situation and cause it to be best for them. I ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So sorry to hear about that, Dan. Yeah. Dan. We're grieving with you. Likewise. So um, we can continue praying about that. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I, I, anyway, God bless everybody. Have a wonderful day. I'm gonna got, got to be going here. Yeah. So uh, I give my love to Carol. We'll do. Did anybody else have any questions? Well, it's confusing. That's <laughs> It's well, he did, he did say that was that what he was going to say about that was very controversial. So, you know, oh, yeah, that's I'm, true. But I really, I really appreciate, you know, there was a lot of really great stuff. Um, you know, I think especially some of the, the, seeing the themes, that one that you showed how, which, um, gosh, what was it? You showed it over and over again, um, and it made it really clear what, John was arguing about. I'm gonna have to go back through your your PowerPoint. I, I think you're muted, Dustin. Or is it, is it the obedient son motif? Yes. Yeah. 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 How over and over and over again that that's coming up, and and uh, well, it seems like it was part of that. There was something more specific in that context that you were showing that. That John is saying over and over again. It's it, it, it was really clear after you went through that that these are the themes that he's talking about. Yeah. These are the problems he's addressing to his well, audience. And and if, if you've if you've kind of listened carefully to how I put all of these teachings together, um, this is not just, you know, what is the gospel of John and give me the ABCs of it. It's how to study the gospel of John. I've tried to identify um, who wrote it, <clears throat> who is the intended audience. What can we know about that intended audience? What are some of the emphases? Can this help us explain the social situation as to why this gospel was written? How do we um, read the gospel, <clears throat> excuse me, as, <clears throat> as Greco-Roman biographies? Um, how are they supposed to be understood? And applying all of those things to how we study each individual gospel. I've been very, very deliberate about that. Um, and I've tried to like, I've tried to set the rules that are there and I've tried to follow my own rules. So at least, um, I mean, people might not agree with my conclusions, but I'm trying to be consistent with my own rules that I'm setting up. Yeah. It was good. It was really good. Definitely. Yeah. I'll be, I, I, uh, I don't know how many times I've watched several of the videos multiple times. It just, you know, you can't really, you can't really absorb it all in one, one listening. So. Uh, before we stop the recording, uh, uh, I, I wanted to say for anybody watching that we, we started a, um, a Christian Virtual Fellowship Facebook page. Uh, if you go to, to Facebook and you do a search for Christian Virtual Fellowship, you'll find the page. If you like it, you'll uh, be able to follow the postings there and we'll post videos uh, on that page um, uh, from our YouTube channel and you can also that uh, through that page you can you know contact us if you're watching this video and you're not participating in these uh, fellowships and you want to just you know uh, post on that page get in contact with us through that page and you can you can join us yeah I like the Thing, what was it said? Uh, um, examining the scripture, scriptures, or something like that. Did you? I put I put the Arborean passage of Acts seventeen eleven on there on purpose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So That's one of my favorite. I, I apologize about that. That's what we do. <laughs> that was good. All right, I'm gonna stop right, recording here. Stop recording here.